Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, joining us. Thanks for inviting me. It's great to be with you today. Uh, it's so nice to be back in person after two years. This is my first one of these doing after two years. Uh, I'm going to speak for just a few minutes and then turn it over to Kurt. We're going to have a discussion, and then we're going to open it up to the audience for some Q&A. And I hope you, uh, I've been in North Dakota a bunch of times, so North Dakotans generally are not shy. I hope you are not shy. I'd love to hear from you and uh, fire away what's on your mind and uh, what you'd like to know about or what you're seeing in your communities. Let me just start by telling you uh, why I'm here and why the Minneapolis Fed is here. In 1913, the United States Congress created the Federal Reserve System, which is our nation's central bank. But Congress did something unique. They said, we don't simply want it in the nation's capital. We want it distributed all the way around the country so that the different regions of the country have a direct voice in the policymaking process. So they created 12 independent Federal Reserve Banks, the ninth of which is the Minneapolis Fed. And our jobs are to represent you. Our jobs are to represent this region, which is Minnesota, North and South Dakota, uh, Montana, the Upper Peninsula, Michigan, and Northwestern Wisconsin. So a big part of our jobs is to spend our time traveling around the district, we call it the district, to hear from you about what's happening in your local economy. And then I go back to Washington, D.C. every six weeks for federal open market committee meetings. And part of what I'm doing in those meetings is talking about what's happening here in our regional economy. So meetings like this, I've got a day full of events here. They're really good for me to be able to hear directly from folks what's happening in the regional economy. Now, we cannot set a different monetary policy or a different interest rate for North Dakota and for California or for New York because we all use the same dollar. So it's one interest rate for the whole country. But we want to try to pick that monetary policy that's the best we can for the country as a whole and making sure that our region is part of that process and part of that deliberation is literally my job. And so I appreciate you being here today. Let me just spend a couple minutes on what's going on in the economy. I'm sure it's top of mind for folks. And then I'm going to turn it over to Kurt, and we're going to have a good discussion. Obviously, inflation is very high right now. Big surprise, at least for me, uh, that inflation has gotten this high and stayed this high for as long as it has. You know, the U.S. economy went through a rapid shutdown, much, much of it, I know less so in North Dakota because of COVID, and has now been reopening, and that reopening has been uneven. Basically, demand has picked up more quickly than supply has been able to catch up. And so six months or so ago, I thought, well, this is probably going to be a temporary phenomenon that we're seeing, because supply chains are going to get sorted out, people are going to come back to work, that's going to give the, businesses, the workers that they need, and then you'll start to see supply return. At the same time, I expected demand to normalize. You know, when much of the U.S. economy was shut down, you couldn't go out to restaurants, people were not traveling, they weren't going to hotels. So what were people doing? They were either saving a lot of money, or they were spending it on goods rather than on services. Cars, washers and dryers, gym equipment for your home because your gym might have been closed. So we, if you looked at the economic data, goods consumption went way up and services consumption went down. Well, that seems like that should be a temporary phenomenon, and as the economy reopens, that will go back to normal. Interestingly, uh, that hasn't happened. The goods consumption has stayed elevated while services consumption has picked up. That's not what I expected to see. And so that tells me, okay, that's part of the inflation story. Maybe that's going to normalize and goods will come back down as services fully recovers, or maybe it's going to be sustained. We just don't know right now. So about six months ago, the Federal Open Market Committee started adjusting what we call forward guidance, adjusting how we are likely going to set interest rates in the future. And now we've done the first interest rate increase last week, and we've signaled we expect there will probably be six more this year, 25 basis point increases. It could be more could be less. I, I think that I penciled in in my forecast that we'd have seven this year, but it's really going to depend on the economic data. If some of this, these imbalances that I described start to sort themselves out in the next few months, and I hope they do, then maybe we won't need as many. But if they don't, and if the high inflation is sustained and there continue to be worker shortages around the country, then maybe we'll end up having to do more. You know, we will have to see how the data uh, evolves. But I've certainly shifted my views quite dramatically in the past six months. The committee has moved quite aggressively. And the one thing everybody should know is 
100% of the people on the Federal Open Market Committee are committed to us getting back to our 2% inflation target. There's no, there's no disagreement about that. All, all of them, you know, we have different views on what it's going to take to get there, but we are all going to committed to watching the data and adjusting what we need to do based on what happens in the economy. And so that's where we are. It's an uncertain time, and obviously everything that's happening in Ukraine, the tragedy in Ukraine, is making all of these problems worse because you've got high oil prices, high commodity prices, supply chains that are potentially affected by that. That makes this uh, an even more challenging uh, problem, uh, but we're going to tackle it. So with that quick overview, I hope that uh, sets the groundwork. Kurt, over to you. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you, uh, everybody, and good morning. And thank you, President Kaspari, for coming away. Uh, and uh, as the President said, uh, congratulations, everybody. Doesn't this feel great? A round of applause for yourselves for being here. Come on. We're back in person. And uh, as Shannon mentioned, uh, to the 24 other chambers that are joining us online, um, another phenomenal opportunity. Uh, my kudos, uh, having been in public service for a long time, uh, watching what the Fargo-Moorhead West Fargo Chamber is doing from an innovation standpoint, bringing in chambers from all over the Midwest to share, to listen, uh, those that maybe are back in, in service and can't be here, but having this online and being able to, to access this uh, after the effect is fantastic. So, um, as uh, Shannon said, uh, my name is Kurt Zellers. I'm the Vice President of Communications and Public Affairs for Primacy Strategy Group. Uh, we're a public affairs and lobbying firm here in Bismarck, as well as in St. Paul and in Washington, D.C., and just in uh, opening up in South Dakota. Uh, my primary job is uh, working on public policy and uh, the public relations and media relations side, but uh, also, uh, you know, nightlight as a uh, host for events like this. So when the opportunity came up to uh, work and, and interview President Kashkari, uh, w uh, even before the Russian invasion, I jumped at the chance now with interest rates uh, the invasion, the world stage as it is. Um, we're going to settle in here for about two and a half hours, so hopefully you guys got enough cut. Oh, you guys aren't quite awake yet for my good dad jokes. Um, we're going to get as much as we can. Um, as I said before, there are going to be microphones around the room here, so if you have a question, please raise your hand in advance so that everybody doesn't rush to, to get to the end. And then for online folks, make sure and put that into the queue. Um, Catherine or Kale will be able to get those questions up to us so we can uh, start to make sure, but I'm going to ask a few big basic questions to get us going, but really do want to hear from the crowd. So please, uh, as you're looking around the room, uh, look for those microphones. Uh, the, the state of the economy in general, you, you led right into what I'd like to start with is those interest rates. Um, you know, I, I read there was an article in the Star Tribune just last weekend. Um, you had been pretty uh, adamant and pretty, uh, uh, not I don't want to say, you know, concrete on it, but you've been opposed to those rate increases. What was that change? Uh, you alluded to it a little bit, but what was that change that you saw that made you think that that needed to be done? And then you, you kind of led into how long this could take. Where do you see that supply chain? Is that the number one thing that's holding things up, or is it just a combination of everything? Well, it's, um, it's a combination of a lot of things. So one thing that for the last five or six years, before the pandemic, we kept thinking that, oh my gosh, we're at full employment or maximum employment, all the Americans who want to work have jobs. And then we kept getting surprised as more and more Americans were coming off the sidelines and taking jobs. Or, <clears throat> excuse me, folks that we thought would retire didn't retire. They said, I'm going to work for a few more years. That's really good for the U.S. economy. The more Americans that are working, the higher our productive capacity. So we kept getting faked out by the U.S. economy. Turns out we were not at full employment. There were more workers there. And then... The pandemic hit, many Americans lost their jobs, many Americans left the workforce. And nine months ago or so, we were probably missing four or five million workers from the workforce or where we should have been if there had been no pandemic. And people pointed to a lot of different factors. They pointed to unemployment benefits that were generous, that were, you know, some people said, oh, this is incentivizing people not to come back. Well, those expired in August or September of last year. We had schools around the country that were closed which created huge childcare challenges for families, especially with young children. That was keeping some people out of the workforce. And then there was fear of COVID, just people were nervous about getting sick. And so schools then reopened, uh, the unemployment benefits expired, COVID vaccines became more widely available, and we did start to see more and more workers come back in. So part of what I was arguing was, let's not shortchange the American worker. I believe the vast majority of Americans wanna work, I believe they will come back if given the chance. Now, they have come back, right? Uh, in the last six months, the U.S. economy has created about 580,000 jobs a month. 
That is really strong job growth. So that's been positive, yet it's not been enough to keep inflation in check. And so that's, I, I think it's just a constellation of all of that data that got me and my colleagues to say, okay, this is not evolving exactly as we expected, and so we need to adjust. In terms of supply chain, <clears throat> six months or so ago, my economist and I did a round of calls with some of the biggest businesses that are headquartered in this region, global companies, and they're all name brands that you know, that have operations all around the world. And I asked the CEOs and the head of supply chains, what's going on in your supply chains? And they said, it's not getting better. They said, every time we put out a fire in one market, something else burns somewhere else. And we are just, it's like whack-a-mole. And I said, well, when do you think it's gonna get better? And they said, we're guessing, not in 2022, maybe in 2023, but who knows? And that also opened my eyes that, oh my gosh, this is, this is gonna last longer than I expected. Uh, and you know, the data just keeps coming in that direction, and so of course we have to respond. So two follow-ups to the, to the supply chain. The, the great resignation, as it's, it's some, some of the media call it, uh, and then, you know, the, how is automation going to play a part of that? You know, I, I, I heard an ad on the drive up here yesterday that um, is it, it was Quick Trips. If you are a sponsor, congratulations. You got bonus advertising. Um, but talking about drivers making $93,000 a year, $93,000 a year to do delivery routes. Is, is the supply chain and that great resignation, is that going to, you know, kind of fast forward? Are we going to see driverless semis on the road next year? Will that be 2023, 2024? Or... It, will the worker eventually come back or will that market adjust? And again, if, the, if you get paid $100,000 to do route delivery for a quick trip or for Super America, so I make sure equal adver advertising there, is that gonna be a part of this new change then in, in what you're seeing? You know, as the economy has gotten strong and workers have more choices, and by the way, that's a good thing. Like the, the highest wage increases we are seeing are for the lowest income workers. These are folks who are long overdue for a raise. I'm glad they have more choices than they had before. I think you are seeing a churning in the labor market. I don't really buy this great resignation story. I think you're seeing a great job switching story, which is people are switching away from the toughest jobs to more attractive jobs. One thing I hear from all the big businesses that I talk to is, oh my gosh, we can't get long haul truckers. Yeah, that's a tough job to be a long haul trucker because you're away from home for a week. But you are seeing more people hired in local delivery because that's a better job. Guess what? You get to sleep in your own bed. You get to be with your family. <clears throat> Another job that's really tough but really important are childcare workers, right? I've got two young children, a one-year-old and a three-year-old. Childcare workers are profoundly important to our society. They're also paid really, really poorly. And so as they look at, well, I can go to Walmart or I can go to Target and I can make 13 or 15 bucks an hour and that's an easier job, why don't I go do that? And so you're seeing a churn away from the toughest jobs into more attractive jobs, not more important jobs, but more attractive jobs. And so society's gonna have to adjust because we still need long haul truckers and as much as Silicon Valley promises us it's around the corner that we're gonna have driverless trucks, it always seems to be around the corner. So you know, we'll see when it arrives. And there's some jobs like childcare, you know, there's no robot that can do childcare. And we need high quality childcare workers and that means we're gonna have to pay them more. And we ought to pay them more. So uh, a question coming in online, uh, I'll go back up a little bit. Um, so the, the question's back on the, the interest rates and, and this, especially you know, where your position has been. The, the question is why not uh, move interest rates faster rather than continue the slow kind of quarter, quarter, quarter? Um, it would be a little bit of shock to the market, but it would make the recovery speed up, would it? it maybe it wouldn't. Uh, so basically the tear the Band-Aid approach off, right? Just hit it with two points or two and a half points versus a quarter, quarter, quarter. And, um, this is definitely out of my end of the, I'm in the shallow end of the pool now, so this is, I'm dr dangerously try, you know, going into this question, but what, why, why the policy? And maybe that's a little deep for uh, you know, 7.30 breakfast, but well, you know, fast versus slow. Because I'll say a few things. One is we, we're gonna get more information. And let's say that these supply chains do start to sort themselves out. Let's say the more workers do come back in, uh, maybe we're not gonna have to move as far as we otherwise would. And so there's a danger to overdoing it and ending up not needing all of that medicine, so to speak, uh, number one. Number two, <clears throat> the way monetary policy works, it's an it's a interesting thing. It doesn't just work based on what we did last week, moving 0.25%. It actually moves based on what we signal we're gonna do in the future. So you know mortgage rates have moved up quite a bit. 
Even before we moved interest rates 25 basis points last week, we hadn't moved them at all. Mortgage rates moved up a lot over the last six months just because we indicated we are going to be acting. And so the path of interest rate rates actually matters a lot. And we have already moved the path of interest rates quite dramatically in the past six months. So I would just encourage people, don't just focus on that 25 basis points. Focus on what we've signaled about the path. That's what's determining what's happening. You know, you, the 25 basis points is an overnight interest rate that banks charge each other. Nobody cares about an overnight interest rate. You know, if you go get a mortgage, you care about rates over the next 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. It's that path that actually matters, and there we've made a big move. So, and, and uh, again, if, uh, those of you in the room, uh, the online questions are coming in great. Thank you to the audience uh, across the Midwest. Uh, anyone in the room, again, if you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand. There are some folks walking around with microphones, so please, they'll find you. Um, so we're, we're going to go quickly now into workforce. Uh, that's a, a big issue up here. Um, North Dakota, um, being from here, from Devil's Lake and attending UND, uh, this has been an issue that hasn't come up just in the last couple of years. This has been a growing problem uh, with the Bakken. and you know, a lot of folks went west uh, that maybe could have been staying here in Fargo or Grand Forks or uh, maybe Jamestown. Where do you see that workforce development? And we hear it constantly, as you mentioned, the, the daycare shortage up here is, is unheard of. I, I had even no idea there's no third shift daycare for people who are working in longer jobs or a third shift. Where do you see that workforce development? What's the new model? Is it the four-year degree? Is it trade school? Is it a combination? Is it a hybrid? Do we start juniors in high school on a path versus waiting until they hit that graduation deadline and then go into training? Where, where do you see that new, <laughs> the new new model that is reacting to the current state of the economy? Well, I think um, because it has been an ongoing issue in North Dakota, uh, first thing we have to do is make sure that we're actually training and reaching everybody who's here, right? We don't do that today, right? There are people who fall through the cracks of our education system and who don't get the basic skills. I'm not saying go to a four-year college. I'm saying be able to be productive contributors to our economy. So that's number one, is making sure we actually reach and train everybody who's here. Uh, number two, this is math. I mean, look, our economy is going to grow in part by population growth. Like, that's just, it's just math. If you have more people, you have more people producing things and you have more people consuming things. So if we want our economy to grow, we need people. Now, birth rates in advanced economies have been declining for decades. They've been declining in America. We're having fewer kids than prior generations. So either we accept slower growth which is all the challenges that folks in North Dakota are aware of, or we embrace immigration. That's it. Now, I'll tell you, Japan is trying a different strategy, which is they're trying to create tax incentives and whatnot to encourage their folks to have more babies. Right? That is a very challenging thing to pull off. And by the way, at a minimum, it takes about 20 years to work, just to do the math, okay? <laughs> but, <clears throat> so if you want to wait 20 years, maybe we could try that strategy. You know, this is just math. So right now, what North Dakota did during the oil boom is you drew in workers from all around the country because you paid way up. That works if it's one hot local market. That does not work if the U.S. economy as a whole needs workers. And right now, the U.S. economy as a whole needs workers. So ultimately, this is a political question which we as a country have to decide. Immigration has been a huge source of competitive strength for America over its history. It can be again, but we have to make that political decision. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested. Is that it's vouchers for dinner? Is it vouchers for date night? Uh, it's an interesting Japan strategy. Um, one of the things that, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, after three kids, I, we're, we're done. So I'm out of the yeah, out of the mix. Um, one question online, uh, leading back to that. Um, you know, in the the churn of the labor market, the quickly rising wages, generous hiring bonuses. Um, is that getting to overheated and would, could it lead to a protracted period of wage stagnation once that market does renormalize? So, we're, you know, everybody, like you said, the, the boom out west, you know, what happens when that, you know, does it get to a point where there's a stagnation in there? Well, I think what we're trying to do in terms of the Fed is we are trying to engineer, people call it a soft landing, which is you have a, a, a booming economy and what we're doing right now is we're taking our foot off the accelerator to try to let things normalize where supply and demand can come into balance into a more sustained growth rate. The question that a lot of economists ask is, well, if you look historically, sometimes when the Federal Reserve, maybe often when the Federal Reserve has tried to cool things down, you end up leading to a recession. 
and then you end up having an increase in unemployment and some of those jobs end up being lost. That's what we want to try to avoid. Uh, I think it's just going to be determined by you know, how the economy unfolds, how many workers come back, what's going to happen to supply chains, do some of these inflation pressures uh, relieve on their own, and how much of it do we have to do to try to bring supply and demand into balance? It's an, uh, I hope we can engineer the soft landing. No, no, no pressure, <laughs> not at all, but um, I don't know if I, everybody still hear me? I may, nope. have, my, may have lost a battery here. Um, I, there you go. There we go. Um, so one of the other areas uh, with the challenges of workforce is workforce housing. So that segment of the population that's maybe in first or second year um, career part, part of their job, that housing isn't there, that level for them. Unfortunately, in Minneapolis market, it's exploding. Uh, you, that first or second home for a family is unaffordable. On current rates, where, <laughs> time my comments out. Where do you see that, that workforce housing for that first or second job family that needs a space to work? Uh, needs a, a space to live after getting that first or second job. Yeah, so we're, uh, housing is a huge issue all around the district. This is a completely uh, self-made problem. I would say man-made, but it's man and woman-made problem. Right? If you look around North Dakota, there's a lot of land in North Dakota. A lot of places to build. A lot of places to build in Minnesota. A lot of places to build in Montana. And yet we all create barriers that make it more expensive for new supply to come in. Simply put, there is no state in the country, there is no federal government in the country that you can subsidize your way out of this problem because the need is massive. Even if the legislature comes in and says, we're gonna double our investment in affordable housing, that's great. It is a grain of sand in the, in the beach of need uh, in North Dakota, in Minnesota, et cetera. And we're all, we're all at fault. You know, I live in a community, a western suburb in North Dakota where we have big lot sizes because my neighbors and I like having big lots. And that makes it more expensive. If somebody wanted to build a home in our region, it makes it more expensive. Or you have minimum number of bedrooms or car garages or in California, mandatory solar panels. Each one of these sounds good. Each one of these is well-meaning. When you add it up and add it up, add it up, it just raises the minimum cost of a unit or of a house to unaffordable levels. So it's completely man and woman made problem. And the question is, do we have the courage to actually look ourselves in the mirror and realize <clears throat> we're the creator of this and we have the power to do something about it? That's it. And, and for those regional centers, that, the, the challenge, right? So whether we're here in North Dakota, it's Iowa, it's you know, Michigan, as those regional centers become more and more important as the communities around them get a little smaller, it exasperates the problem. How, how do you encourage that policy then to push, you know, and I, I don't tell my wife I said this, but leave Maple Grove and maybe move to Alexandria or maybe move to a smaller town that, is, that has the need, has, the, has a, a, a workforce need, but also has the housing affordability. Well, one of the things that the pandemic has shown us is, and this, you all knew this before, but it's really become clear to almost everybody now, is there, how, criti how critical broadband is, affordable broadband to communities all across North Dakota, all across Minnesota. So that, because now more and more jobs are becoming remote, and now all of a sudden you could live in the small town that you want to live in. If you have access to broadband, you can live in that small town and have a good job and be able to support the local community. So for 100 years, rural communities in America have been drying up because people have been going to the cities for college, staying there for economic opportunity, <clears throat> and that's, been, that's created huge pressures on small towns across America. It may now be that technology has changed that. I mean, maybe, maybe it's made that not necessarily a one-way street for so many small towns in America, but we need to make sure that that broadband is available, the basic infrastructure is there, <clears throat> and hopefully the infrastructure bill that they passed in Congress will help uh, make that possible for, for communities all across, but it is a huge challenge. Hey, uh, a perfect segue, and if there's anybody out in the crowd again, uh, please don't be shy. I I've known uh, very few people in Fargo to be shy, so please raise your hand and uh, somebody with the microphone will come over uh, and ask a question, but uh, you, you led perfectly into the next topic area, federal spending. Um, broadband is, uh, is a great example of where I think the government actually has been doing a good job, uh, but where do you see the, you know, some of the previous spending, whether it was the, the help with the, the COVID relief, uh, some of the infrastructure um, build back better or whatever the uh, walking zombie that used to be build back better 
uh, is going to fund. How do you see that federal funding? Has it worked? Uh, are there some states that have done a better job of, of using those funds as they've been given, in some cases, several billions of dollars? Uh, and then do you see a need for additional you know, bills out of Washington? I know there's Build Back Better is going to be skinny down to something you know, maybe smaller, just a couple of trillion instead of four or five trillion. Uh, but where do you see that federal policy and has it worked? Well, I would give, um, you know, our political process is imperfect, but I think it's better than, you look around the world, by comparison, it's pretty good, actually. It's imperfect and as ugly as it can seem. And I actually give Congress and both uh, the Trump and the Biden administrations great credit for, they responded aggressively to the pandemic. Like, none of us knew how deep the hole was going to be how many Americans were going to lose their jobs, how long those jobs would take to come back. And one of the things that we learned, I was in the middle of the 08 financial crisis. Uh, we, the error that we made during the 08 crisis is we were always a little bit late and we're always a little bit small in our response. And so we ended up having a 10-year very slow recovery. This recovery, by comparison, has been a rocket ship. And that's in part because the Fed learned its lesson and we were more aggressive this time. And Congress and the executive branches were very aggressive in supporting businesses and supporting families who were impacted by the pandemic. Now, history, it turns out now, I think history is going to show that they, they did more than they needed to do. But in the moment, you didn't know how deep the hole was. You didn't know if you were looking into the abyss. And so I, I said strongly at the time, it's better to err on the side of doing too much rather than too little. And I think that Congress saw that agreed with that, and that's what they did, not because of me. They, they reached that conclusion on, the, on their own. So I give them a lot of credit for that. Now, where do we go from here? You know, I don't know. I mean, there are some, we're each gonna have a spending priority that we think is important, and that's what's tough about the political process, right? I, I made the case earlier in this conversation. I said infrastructure and, and uh, broadband internet is really important. I also made the case that hey, we, child care is actually really important for the country and our child care workers need to get paid more. Oh, that costs money and that has to come from somewhere. And I bet somebody else here will have their own spending priority that they would suggest. And if you look at it, it's probably a good idea. Well, you put all of this together and we all have our ideas, it adds up to big, big, big dollars. And so ultimately it's a political process that sorts through that and tries to figure out what are we gonna invest in as a country. And so, you know, I think they'll figure it out. Well, and, and since we are uh, 24 chambers around uh, the Midwest here, do you, are there, and, and you don't have to call it a favorite, not, you know, because we're in North Dakota and say they're doing a great job, but um, do you see a state that has, has kind of figured that out? Like, we're going to use this amount of money for infrastructure on roads, we've got some broadband money, and then we're dipping into housing over here. H has anybody figured out that magic formula yet? And, or a, a piece part, maybe not the whole formula, but two or three things that have really taken off that are being successful in those local economies in a, in a mid upper Midwestern state here? Well, I'll say, um, I can speak about Minnesota uh, because I know it the best. <clears throat> I don't know what every state is doing. I serve uh, with um, the deed commissioner uh, on a task force for Governor Walls. Uh, there's a, it's a task force that's trying to advise the governor and the executive branch in Minnesota on, you know, how to spend their surplus and what to be investing in for long-term economic growth for the state. Uh, and so it's great that Steve Grove is here and will be addressing you uh, later today. One of the things that I argued in the early part of our work was that I went back to broadband and I said broadband is paramount for so much of our economy, for healthcare delivery, for education. A lot of money is coming from the federal government. Whatever the hole that is left, whatever gap is left, I said Minnesota ought to just finish the job. I don't know if the gap is $5 million or $500 million, but anywhere you go in Minnesota, you ought to be able to get access to high quality, high speed, affordable broadband. And I think the governor agreed with that. Again, it wasn't my idea. I'm sure that he already, I know Steve was already there. Um, but that's an example of let's just finish the job using the one-time money that the state has. My assumption is that other states like North Dakota also have people who are looking at this both in the administration and advisors who are saying, what can we best use this money for to build out our needs in North Dakota? So I, I'm confident that um, you know, we elect people who take their job seriously and are doing their very best to make the best decisions for their voters. 
Yeah, oh, and, and luckily, uh, Sean Riley from uh, the North Dakota, he prefers IT guy, by the way, he said, uh, I have permission to use that, uh, has never been more excited at a, at a breakfast in his life. <laughs> federal, federal money, state money being coming down. Um, one of the questions um, we, uh, coming in from uh, online is, uh, you mentioned the short-term rates have moved up quickly uh, due to the forward guidance. However, the long-term rates have very relatively slow. Is that concerning to you? Well, it, so this is a good question. This issue, so we, if you think about the, I've, I pay a lot of attention to the 10-year Treasury yield. So when the U.S. government borrows money for 10 years, what is the yield on that bond? Part of that yield is a reflection of the expected path of interest rates, right? If, you, if we told you interest rates are going to be 5% at least for the next 10 years, you would expect the 10-year yield to be at least 5%. So part of it is what's inter, what are interest rates going to be? Part of it is what are inflation? What is the expectation for inflation? Well, the 10-year Treasury is right now around 2.3%. It's still quite low relative to history. That is telling me a number of things. That is telling me that the interest rate environment that we're in, the interest rate that determines the neutral level of stimulus, neither stimulating or restraining the economy, is quite low relative to history. And it's telling us that inflation expectations, people's confidence about inflation in the future, is also close to where it should be. So on one hand, it's comforting because it suggests that inflation expectations are anchored. On the other hand, it's telling us, hey, the U.S. economy's long-run growth potential is still modest. And so it, it's telling us a lot of different things. And one thing that people pay a lot of attention to are where are short-term interest rates relative to long-term interest rates. When the yield curve, as they call it, inverts, it has been a signal that there may be a recession coming in the future. It is not inverted yet but it is getting flatter. To me, you know, trying to simplify everything I just said, the 10-year Treasury to me and the shape of the yield curve gives me feedback on where we are relative to neutral. So I have said that I think the neutral interest rate, federal funds rate, is around 2%. Uh, and that, the 10-year Treasury is telling me it probably still is around 2%. So anyway, it's a very, it's a very technical question that was asked. There's a lot in there but it's something I pay a lot of attention to. Well, I think when you, when you look at folks in the upper Midwest around the agriculture you know, and business development, they look at those rates because a lot of that planning, um, you know, our family farm's still up by Devil's Lake, you know, they start planning in December. They don't wait until, you know, oh my God. So the, that rate increase, the current one, but then that long-term rate is, yeah, as they're planning and as farms are being passed down, that's a, a huge concern. So uh, one other question around, um, <laughs> and I, I, I hazard to do this because I'm sure you get asked this around, but it's a very short and to the point question. Is crypto real or just a flash in the pan and should it be regulated? I know that's a, a, a hot topic and I'm sure everybody in the room either has crypto or is getting crypto or what crypto to get. But you know, as we, as this new reset now with Russia and Ukraine and the world markets, what does that do to it and, 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 how, and, and what is an opinion on that if, is from a regulatory standpoint? Yeah, so I have, um, I've developed pretty strong views on crypto, which is I've said publicly uh, that it's, from what I can tell, 95% noise, hype, and confusion. And I'm, I'm reserving judgment on the last 5% that maybe something useful could come out of the last 5%. Uh, the most basic question I always ask people who are excited about it is, what can you do with a cryptocurrency that you cannot do today? So first of all, digital currencies exist today. I can send anybody in this room $5 instantly with Venmo or PayPal or Zelle. That is a digital currency. So what could I do with Bitcoin that I can't do with that? And then I just get a bunch of uh, fancy words, uh, word salad, and nobody can articulate what the use case is. And then they will say, well, no, 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 if you look at Venezuela, or if you were in Russia and you didn't want to be, have these sanctions imposed on you, you could get around the sanctions with Bitcoin. Okay, I get that. Why would America be in favor of that? So the use case other than for trying to get around sanctions or for drug lords or for money launderers, it is not obvious to me what any normal person could do with this thing that you cannot do today using a commercial product like Venmo, PayPal, or Zelle. So, you know, we'll see. Maybe something useful will come of it. Um, well, we'll and it's uh, great as you can see the sponsor on the wall, Bremer Bank, thanks you for that endorsement. <laughs> Happy to go down to your local Bremer Bank. They'll be happy to help you open up that checking and savings account. Um, so uh, getting a little more local, and I apologize to some of our other friends here in the, the Midwest, but uh, really because it's uh, you know, Western North Dakota, this is an online question that 
um, a little bit longer, but uh, I think really fits with the, also where the economy is. The domestic oil and gas uh, public companies appear to be reticent to deploy capital in the Bakken due to some of the current administration uh, SEC policies. Doesn't seem to be holding back private companies and hedge funds. Is there anything the Federal Reserve can do to facilitate capital investment, thereby increasing domestic energy security in the current geopolitical environment? Well, um, I've been asking this question. You know, one of the things, the, the breakthrough, the technology revolution that has been fracking and horizontal drilling, I, I believed essentially put a cap on the price of oil. You know, when oil prices would go up, the frackers would get out there, and it's much quicker to bring more production online there than in a traditional oil field. So I'm surprised that that has not yet happened. And so I've been making a round of calls into the oil and gas sector, uh, including last week I did an event on Friday with Senator Kramer from North Dakota and the North, North Dakota Petroleum Council to hear directly from producers on what's going on. And it's a lot of different things that is keeping back some new supply. It is a lack of confidence that prices are gonna stay high. They're like, we're gonna go make these investments and then prices come back down and then we're in trouble again with our investors. Uh, there are workforce issues, you know, finding the workers that they need. Uh, then there's the regulatory environment, the political environment, et cetera. And so trying to determine which, I think the most important factor is the economic one, which is, hey, we're just not sure how long these prices are gonna stay high. But all of it matters. I mean, I'm basically of the camp, right now we need all the energy production we can get. You know, and do we need to transition to a clean future? Absolutely. But you know, one of my friends who used to be on our board, Kathy Nezit, uh, from the oil region in western North Dakota. She's talking about um, technology development of carbon capture and sequestration that's going on in North Dakota right now that is showing real promise. I hope so. I mean, I hope those things end up working because that could be really powerful for the U.S. economy on a number of different dimensions. And so right now, my message is we need all of the above. That doesn't mean that we don't need to have a clean future. We do but we need a lot of breakthrough technologies on a lot of different fronts to make that happen. And I think carbon capture and sequestration is, I hope is gonna be a piece of that. Yeah, and uh, kudos to the Berg administration for really leading on that on a national basis. It's not just here in the upper Midwest. Uh, we just have a couple minutes uh, left here, so I, I wanna you know, get down to, and this is a you know, giant question for as we're heading out. Uh, the, the, the debt that the federal government is incurring as we're you know, spending, helping, you know, aiding our way out of this. Where do you see that going in three minutes or less? Where do you see that going um, forward? And then are, are we on the precipice of getting a little too close to the edge? Or is it right because we've never been in a pandemic like this uh, that we have to deal with a situation like this? I, I think the pandemic spending was appropriate. It's, it's kind of like war spending. I mean, the U.S. government debt ballooned during World War II, and then it gradually came back down. So I think the key question is going to be what happens after this pandemic period is over and what are the fiscal plans going forward. By the way, it goes back in part to demographics. I mean, for example, a lot of our social programs, Social Security, Medicare and Medicaid, are paid for by current workers paying for current retirees. And as our society ages, those ratios get, go into the red. And so if we don't do anything on the immigration front, our budget situation is going to be a lot harder going forward. You know, the, in terms of how close we are to the precipice, this is a relative game, meaning investors around the world, for all of our dysfunction and all of our challenges in America, investors around the world look at America and say, this is a better place to invest than anywhere else in the world. I mean, it's not even close. And so that's why the U.S. government is able to borrow at very low rates. And so if Europe really got sorted out and became economically strong and competitive, or China did, Investors might say, hey, I'd rather invest in Europe or in China. So, you know, at some point that might happen. I'm still fully all in on the USA for our competitive strengths. Uh, we got to keep investing, keep do making smart policy choices, and I think we will be very competitive around the world. But that's really what it's going to come down to. Right now, America is still the best place in the world to invest because of our rule of law, because of our innovation culture, our education systems, et cetera. We need to keep our competitive advantage, and then we will be able to continue to borrow and fund ourselves at attractive levels. Well, and, and that uh, the investment and the the, uh, the next conversation, will, uh, Shannon's asked, well, we're going to do this once a quarter. I hope you're fine coming up, and <laughs> Chamber will have this scheduled once a quarter. But uh, we really do appreciate, uh, it, we could have gone for an, at least another hour. I have a, a stack of questions here, but we really appreciate you coming up, President Kashkari. Those of you who are, were online as well, 
Um, if they would like to follow some of your research, if they would like to, to follow up on some of the other, you, you do several of these. I watched a few of your uh, other interviews over the weekend. Where can uh, folks look for that online? Just come to our website, MinneapolisFed.org. We always uh, record these, live stream them, put them on the website. We, we create a lot of research uh, on national, global, and local issues. Uh, just please sign up uh, to our mailing list. Uh, we love to stay in touch with you. And if you see things that you think are important, please reach out. We'd love to hear from you. Fantastic. Well, thank you, everybody. We appreciate your time, President Kashkari. Thank you for having me.